today we're going to talk about something that's crucial for every single one of us, and especially as a church. You hear us say this as a church a lot. We long and desire, tape's coming off. We long and desire to know and follow and share Jesus Christ. Well, this morning we see a powerful story in the Gospel of Mark, chapter two, where we'll be, about a story about that is so targeted, so focused on teaching us, equipping us to to, uh, reach, to impact, to share the gospel with those who are far from God. So, if you have friends that don't know Jesus, um, if you have coworkers, neighbors, um, if you have uh, classmates, roommates, hallmates, teammates, or former cellmates that don't know Jesus, this story is for you. And if you find yourself here today not believing in Jesus, you just come up in here and say, let's see what this is about. We're really glad you're here. We, I believe that this story has something powerful for you also. Now, let me, allow me to give you the context that, uh, that uh, surrounds the events of what we're about to read. Jesus is traveling all over the place. He's preaching the gospel. He's calling people to repent and believe in him. And as he's traveling, he's healing a ton of miracle, a ton of people. And as he's healing a ton of people, he's attracting a rather ginormous crowd because the miracles are kind of big. And as his teaching is beginning to stir up, and such, his teaching is beginning to stir up such a searing hatred amongst those called the, the scribes and Pharisees, the, the so-called spiritual uh, elite, have you. Now, Jesus is spending a lot of time in the synagogues and he's teaching, okay, but he's also spending a lot of time in homes. Do you have a home or a dorm room or whatever? If this is a wonderful place where God loves to show his love um, to your neighbor. And so Jesus is spending a lot of times a lot of time in homes and um, teaching there. Towards the end of chapter one, he's in Capernaum at the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew. And Mark tells us in chapter one of verse 33, uh, just to give you an idea of who's at these, who fills up these houses, uh, verse 33 says that the whole city was at the front door. Wouldn't you love that? I know you would, I hope so. Well, we're in Mark chapter two where we're at today. Jesus is just returning from a preaching tour and he's back in Capernaum. Maybe, possibly, maybe, we don't know, maybe back in the house of Peter and Andrew, who knows? But we know this, whoever's house this is, it takes a beating, okay? This is the house that the HOA sends letters to, the notices to, that stockpile in the, in the mailbox saying, would you quit clogging up the streets? Your camels are everywhere. Would you just stop, you know, backing up this place? Your, your lawn looks terrible. This is that, this is that house. That's my, that's what I see um, when I read this text. Whosever house it is, some pretty amazing things happen here. Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, I invite you to follow along as I read. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some came, some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, get this, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up. He took his mat and he walked out in in full view of them all. 
This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we come to you together today longing to hear a word from our almighty God. Lord, we're not here for any other reason but then to worship you than to hear from you. And we know that you speak to us through your word. So Lord, we want to have clear minds, open hearts, so that we can receive your truth today and go out here, go outside of these walls different because of who you are, because of your gospel. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Well, recently I experienced one of the more awkward encounters that I have in quite some time. Um, I was at the gym, uh, some of you are already laughing, um, and I was getting my JV workout in. I was getting my JV workout in, and the guy on the bench press next to me, he was D1. He was quite literally, he was D1, and he's next level, and he's getting his workout in, and all of a sudden, I'm getting my reps in, and then I'm resting. I'm resting, you gotta rest, you gotta take a breath, and um, I rest a lot, and uh, I'm sitting there, and, uh, and all of a sudden, I see this man um, shockingly, begin to kind of motion at me, just trying to get my attention. I get my earbuds in, you know, you get your earbuds in. It's not Michael W. Smith. But I'm, I'm, I'm playing, I'm, you know, I'm listening and uh, I, I earbuds out. I'm looking at this man and I'm like, you know, what, what is, what, hey, how's it going? Um, normally, you don't know, like interrupt people when you work, just etiquette, I've learned, I've, I don't know what I'm talking about. But here's the reality. I'm mid-workout between reps. This guy says, hey, can you help me out a little bit? Um, so headphones come out and um, this guy, he has, the, he has the voice of a Greek God and he looked like Poseidon. And I'm kind of curious about what are you about to ask me? And he's asking me this. He said, hey, would you just take a minute? I'm maxing out over here. Would you just help me spot, the, would you just spot me for a second? Okay, how much do you value your life? I, I, can I just, and, I, and I'm sitting here and I find myself in this limbo um, is this man really talking to me? Is he really motioning to me? And, and I figured I had two options. You know, option number one, is this the day that I take Philippians 4.13 out of context and say, I can do this, let's go, 300 pounds. I can do it all. And, or the option number two, do I just pretend like he's not talking to me? He's, he's surely there's someone else around me. And, um, and I just go on about my business. My wish came true. He wasn't talking to me, hence the awkward, because I was talking back with him. He was talking with the guy behind me. And, and when you look behind me, there's muscles on top of muscles, and I'm going, okay, that makes sense, okay? But he did see me in my very confused state, and he said, do you, do you want to give it a go? And I'm like, you know, your earbuds back in, noise of the world back in, and I'm, I'm back to my 50 pounds. And... Um, it's, it's, it, I was very confused. Um, it, it was a troubling moment. Um, I don't know what else to say. I had a protein shake that morning, but I really didn't feel like it was gonna do it. But this is, the, this is, interest, this is what's interesting to me. I feel like sometimes, I just go with me here, stay with me. I feel like sometimes we do that with God. I feel like there's some times where he is like motioning for our attention. Those times when we're in the word of God and we're reading and we're asking him, Lord, what is it that you want me to observe and obey today? And then we come across something that's like a little edgy, a little over the top, a little uncomfortable. And we're like, are you really motioning for me on that one? I think you're talking to somebody else. You close the Bible and your earbuds, the noise of the world go back in and you're like, see you later. And then you just skip it. Or is that just me? We do that. We do that. And, and, and then this is the noise of the world. Just pop, but just put that right back in there. Lord, what is it that you want me to observe and obey in this story? And then we come across like, yeah, no way. Not, not today. Or maybe never. I don't, I'm not going Lord, you want me to be a missionary um, to this person? Maybe you're talking to someone else. Are you really asking me to be a missionary to this neighbor, this coworker, this classmate? Lord, have you seen my syllabus this fall? It's kind of thick. Um, Lord, have you not seen my calendar? I'll screenshot it. I'll send it to you so it can be full view, in full view of you. What I want to do the rest of our time this morning is I want to show us three big thoughts, three big truths that I believe as Christ followers we're called to embrace in order to help those who are far from God move closer to Jesus, the only one who can forgive sins, and lavish us with the freedom we find in him. The first thing that I want to point out is this. We want to be a people that bear some burdens. 
We want to be a people that bear some burdens, to intentionally love and care for those who are carrying some weighty things in life. We want to be a people that bear some burdens. In fact, we see this happening in verse 3. We see this friend group doing, watch this, what they're doing. Verse 3, some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Now, before I go any further, disclaimer, I'm fully aware that I can't carry the burdens of every single person in my life, and, and I'm certain you're aware of that too, and, and, and I, I'm fairly certain that I can't even carry every burden um, in, in, in the life of just one person, but what I am certain of this, and I want us to be certain in, of this together, we are capable of doing this, and that is bearing some burdens in, er- in order to help carry someone to the one who is capable of bearing all said burdens. Are you with me? No, no, no. Are you with me? Like, yeah, like, okay. Um, where are my college students at? But what we are capable of doing is bearing some burdens in order to help carry someone to the one who is capable of bearing every single burden in each person's life. Now, this friend group, this friend group, and this group of four, they knew they were incapable of healing their friend. And so they say this, hey, Jesus is back in town. Um, guys, what do you say? We put some money together, get an Uber. I've got a code. We'll get Johnny to Jesus. We'll just get him to where he needs to go. They look on their app. There's like three camels close by. What do you say? Farthest one, three minutes away. How about it? No, they, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. But instead, this is key. They got involved in his life. They got involved in his life. Um, I'll never uh, forget uh, when I was in college, um, a church was wild enough to call me to be a youth pastor to work with students um, my junior year of college. And so I beelined it to the library and I went to this youth ministry section in the library and I said, Lord, give me something. And um, there was a Bible there too and I read my Bible. But there was, it was this moment where I opened this book up and I've read this quote and I've never forgot it since then, junior year of college. Ain't nobody, and this is, I guess, my version, ain't nobody care what you know until they know that you care. And I know you've heard that saying before, but it's so true. These guys got involved in this guy's life. They were clearly bent on carrying him to the one who could dramatically change his life. As followers of Jesus, we want to get really close to those who are far from God. Those who are far from God and help them, help carry them to Jesus by bearing some burdens. And we want to do it together. So what does this look like? We're going to hurt with those who are hurting. We're going to ask them, how can I help? We're going to look for ways to encourage them, to overwhelmingly, with taste, encourage them. I'm going to practice the ministry of presence and action with them. In the case of this story, we're going to form a team, distribute some weight, and begin to put one foot in front of the other. We want to be a people that bear some burdens. Thought number two I want us to see this this morning. Why is it that we want to be a people that bear some burdens? Because saved people seek to serve people. Because saved people seek to serve people. And here it is. Before we seek to serve people, it kind of has this embedded truth in it that we have to seek people. You are around a lot of people. But can I just... And this challenge is for me too. Do we really see them though? Like, do we like really see them? Um, there was a time in, in seminary where I went through this stretch, this season, where I felt like it was really cold for me. And I began praying and I was like, Lord, I, I, think, I think these books are awesome, but Lord, there's something off here. I find myself not engaging with people. So for six months, every day straight, I prayed Matthew 9, 35 through 38, where Jesus sees the crowds and he had compassion for them. I'm like, Lord God, would you please help me see them like you see them? Please move me like you're moved. And apparently these men got moved enough where they said, Gurney, check, stretcher, check, you know, and they load up their friend and off they go. What does this look like? Distribute some weight. Begin to put one front of, in front of the other. Be a, be a people that want to serve people because saved people seek to serve people. And this is, this is why I say this. If this is what friends do for someone with physical paralysis, what do we as believers do for those who suffer from spiritual paralysis? We seek to serve them, right? We seek to serve them. Now, to what degree 
were these men willing to serve their friend? A, a wild distance, to, to say the least. Look at me, verse 4. Since they could not get their friend to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and began digging through it and then lowered the mat that the man was lying on. Are you seeing this? Just an act this. We gotta get our friend of Jesus. We gotta get our friend of Jesus. We gotta get our friend of Jesus. Oh, wait, hey, front door blocked off, sold out. Um, we, we've got to figure something else out. Plan B, to the roof we go. Think about that. No, no, no barrier is about to block the, this bridge. So they, what do they say? They, they say, to the roof we go. And, and uh, now I did some research on these houses. And uh, from the best what I could read, these are typically your one-story uh, house, uh, uh, stair external staircase, flat roof. Um, for any historians in the room, um, check me. Uh, but typically, one-story house, external staircase, flat roof. You got some, typically some large wooden posts or beams that run from side to side. And in between those beams, you've got some smaller sticks, some smaller wood, what they call thatch. And uh, they got this little stuff that you put mud over and, and, and uh, you cake it over and then you f flatten it out and roll it out. Enough of architecture 101. But uh, they, 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 they get this roof to where I guess it's supposedly capable of digging through. Now, let's just think about this. Let's think about this. Can you imagine the physical strain of carrying someone for, for whatever distance only to discover upon arrival the interest is blocked? Okay, well, guys, we, we, we gave it a shot. We tried maybe 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 next week. No, it's, it's plan B. It's to the roof we go. And, and not just, the text says, not just any part of the roof. The text says they go to the spot that's above Jesus. This is Eagle Scout stuff. We make our drop here. Um, this is like, this is, man, I want to emulate this. I want to be like these guys. I want this small group. And uh, what, what, it, what is this what does this mean for us? Why, why do we do this? Uh, why, are, why is someone breaking through a roof? First, you, you hear the footsteps of the roof. Then you, you start to see just kind of dust um, sprinkling down from the ceiling. The next thing you know, sunlight is piercing through. Um, had to be a decent-sized hole because uh, here comes a man being lowered through the roof. How long did this take? Um, you know, the closest thing that I can think to the closest degree of awkward that I can think of that we encounter today in church is when you're sitting next to the person whose cell phone goes off. First, you hear the vibrate. Then you hear the, 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 the ringtone burst through. Next thing you know, because it's in their purse or fellas' backpack, they get all of a sudden, they have to gather all their things, beeline it out because of how kind of distracting, how uncomfortable that is. And if that's ever you, we have grace for you. But the reality is this. They are in some kind of situation, but yet no barrier is about to block their bridge. So these four guys went on to serve and love their friend by helping him get to Jesus. So what does that look like for us? Well, what does it mean for us to serve someone who's in such deep need? I'm gonna say it like this. We want to sincerely invest in what someone has a serious interest in. We want to sincerely invest in what someone has a serious interest in. Four men carried their paralyzed friend to Jesus. His interest became their all-out investment. And throughout the life of Jesus, we see him brokenhearted over lostness. And we see him rejoicing when people are found. The story of the lost coin, the story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost son. Jesus has an intensity for being in the people business. And we join with Jesus by bearing some burdens and seeking to serve people who are far from God. So this becomes our question. Who in my circle is far from God? And how can I deeply invest in what they're deeply concerned with? How can I help them bear some burdens? The truth is, you, we, you and I, we can't bear every single burden. And there may be people coming to your mind that are in your circle that have some serious burdens to bear. And you know what? Reality is you may not be the person to bear those particular burdens. But first, give God the chance of praying through it. Give God the chance of praying through it. Lord, who is it in my circle that I could help, we could help carry some weight, we could help serve? We seek to serve. Who is it that we want to do this for? We seek to serve those who are far from God. I'm going to say it like this. In other words, this is so corny, but go with it anyway. We want to seek to bow the knee towards their need. We want to seek to bow our knee towards their need. 
We want to seek to bow our knee towards our need. And know this, anytime we embrace the posture of service, know that it's about to get messy. What, these guys here, these guys here, these four friends, did, did they get their chacos dirty that day? Yeah, I would say so. Did they sweat much? Did they have fatigue much? Did, did, they, did they ache much? Were they tired much? Was it worth it much? We find out in verse five. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's talk about Jesus seeing their faith. This is the first, faith, this is the first mention of faith in Mark's gospel. And it's important to note that in this story and everywhere else in this Bible, in, in our Bible, faith is always illustrated by action. Faith is always illustrated by action. These five men committed themselves to taking action. This story has this to say about faith. First and foremost, first and foremost faith is not just some head knowledge about Jesus. Faith is not just some head knowledge about Jesus. Rather, Faith is actively trusting that Jesus is all sufficient for my every single need. It's actively living in a way that continuously rediscovers that Jesus is better. It's actively living in a way that continuously discovers that Jesus is better. So in my life, I'm not going to just acknowledge that God is real and then live as though he's wrong. No, in my life as a follower of Jesus, in our lives, we want to say, oh yes, he's real. And then we want to live as though he's right. And the evidence of that living is what's displaying our faith. James says it like this, faith without works is dead. Faith always acts. Faith always acts always moves towards the direction of Jesus. Faith always pursues Jesus. Faith always overcomes. Now notice this, before Jesus heals the guy, which he eventually does, he goes for his biggest need first, and that's the forgiveness of his sins. When Jesus saw their faith, his first words to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. This is the first thing that Jesus addresses for a reason. Jesus never takes sin lightly, right? Jesus never takes sin lightly. Jesus never told anyone, hey, you're young. Why don't you just go out and live it up a little bit? Come back to me at a little bit later time in life when you're in the minivan with the family and then come back and then get some forgiveness from me. Jesus never says that. Jesus never says to anyone, hey, why don't you go out and just do some good things in your life and, and, and to even help even out the bad. No, Jesus never said any such thing, nothing close to that because Jesus is aware of the soul choking effect that sin has in one's life. So why is this the first thing Jesus addresses in this man's life? Because sin is death, because sin is death and it eternally separates us from God unless we receive God's forgiveness by repenting of our sin and placing our faith in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came to this earth, right? To proclaim this and to provide this forgiveness through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, for those of us who believe in Jesus, forgiveness is where we begin to find our new identity. This is where we begin to find our new identity. I'm forgiven, meaning that when Christ Jesus sees me, he sees me through the lens of the cross, my sins are atoned, my sins are paid for. I'm being made new. I'm being conformed to the image of Jesus. I'm a child of God. I'm adopted by his love. We could go on and on and on as followers of Christ in response to this forgiveness. That's how we respond. That's how our hearts reply, to rejoice in our new identity, to rejoice in the freedom of forgiveness. But what about these four men who finally get their friend to Jesus? And because, I mean, upon lowering him down, the first words they hear him say are, son, your sins are forgiven. How do you think they responded in their heart? Just, we don't know, we, we don't know. But how do you think they responded in their heart? Wow, thank you. Um, now, how about addressing the obvious matter at hand? Can you make him walk again? Can you make him walk again? Don't miss this. When we see Jesus saying, son, your sins are forgiven, there is an all-powerful, critical truth, not just for the man that's being lowered through the roof, not just for the audience that was hearing his words, but for our audience, this room, you who make up this room. And when Jesus says this, the truth that comes out is this. Jesus is saying that there is nothing more important than having a right relationship with God. 
There's nothing more important than having a right relationship with God. Warren, Warren Wiersbe has this to say about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. And it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. Jesus addresses his immediate need first, the immediacy of the gospel, the immediacy of, free, of this man needing forgiveness of his sins in his life. Now, that's not to say Jesus didn't care about his physical condition or about his pain. Jesus knows our pain. He knows the, what, 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 what hurts in your life. And he cares deeply about that. And he goes on to heal this man. But first, he addresses the primary need, the forgiveness of our sins. Now, if, if, if maybe, maybe you're like me and you're reading this story and you're going, how is it that Jesus, like the moment he saw him, he said, G, he said to this man, son, very ter term of endearment, son, your sins are, are forgiven. Um, and we may ask ourselves this because Jesus, you know, doesn't forgive sins in, unless there's repentance, right? And belief, right? So what did he see in this, this man's heart that's apparently not apparent to the eyes of the reader? Um, there's, there's no place anywhere in the Bible where someone gets forgiven when they're unwilling to, to repent. Um, that is to have a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So why was Jesus so quick to forgive? Well, it, this is what we know. A part of Jesus' power is his ability to know what's in your heart, right? A part of Jesus' is power, part of God's who he is, he has the ability to see what's in your heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this, the Lord looks on the heart. 1 Chronicles 28, 9 says, the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and thought. Ezekiel eleven five says, I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. It would appear that Jesus discerned a longing for forgiveness in this man's heart, a desire to, to repent and believe. And the guy didn't even have to verbalize it. Jesus just like saw this in his heart and said, you know, I, your son, your sins are forgiven. What, it seems as though God doesn't just have a willingness to forgive the sinner who repents and believes. It seems like he has this desire to sprint this desire, this a swiftness to apply grace to the one who's seeking, to the one who's, who's, who's in need and longing to repent and believe. He has a swiftness, a sprinter's mentality to forgive the sinner who repents and believes. Now, in, in response to this, may you and I be ever so quick to trust this Jesus with our everything. Well, the moment that Jesus offers the miracle of healing, of forgiveness to the paralytic, the scribes and Pharisees, they begin to get a, a little chirpy in their hearts. Look at me in verse six and seven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there and they're thinking to themselves, why does this guy talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And what started out as Jesus healing the paralytic is now, the story has now shifted to the scribes and Pharisees who are questioning and confronting Jesus' authority. And these guys, they're, they're shocked. They're raging mad about who, what the claims that Jesus is making because who but God can forgive sins? And these guys are exactly right. No one can forgive sins um, but God. In their mind, they're thinking, you know, this man is attempting to rob uh, God of an honor that only he's, he, he is due, but they just haven't clicked yet with them that Jesus is God. So they're ready to charge him with blasphemy. Jesus sensed this in their heart in verse eight and nine. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? Which is easier? Both require omnipotent power. Both require omnipotent power. To say your sins are forgiven, um, it implies that Jesus is God and that he has the authority to forgive sins. And, and to say, for Jesus to say you're forgiven, it's an ultimate implication of what's to come on the cross. And there's nothing easy about the cross because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But the scribes and Pharisees are beginning, they're bent on Jesus being a fake, a blasphemer, and this is true for us today in, in our lives. Either Jesus is real, either Jesus is, is God, or he's a blasphemer, or he's a fake. There's really no middle ground. There's really no middle ground. 
Either we live our daily lives in such a way that says, oh, he's real, and then we seek and yearn to live as though he's right, or we live in a way that says he's really irrelevant. And for those of us who follow Jesus, yes, we still fall short of this. We fall flat on our faces. We, we still fall in sin. But then God in his grace, we remember where he says in 1 John 1, 9, I, am, I can be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to purify you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And when we're struggling to reject sin, we wage war on it. We wage war on it together by repenting, that is seeking a change of mind that leads to a change of action. And we seek to confess it to those who, the appropriate crowd that, to confess it to, to help us overcome, to help us fight, to help us wage war on that sin so that we can get back into the regular rhythm of rediscovering that Jesus is indeed better. But again, in the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes, they said, no, he's a fake. So Jesus does something to change their mind. He says this in verse 10 and 11. But because I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he says this to them. I, and he looks right, he has this look right at the man who has, has, is the paralytic. And he says, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. He got up, he took his mat, he walked out and flew the old them all. This amazed everyone. They praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Jesus, with the same authority that he's been giving to forgive, has chose to use that authority to heal. Jesus essentially said to the scribes and Pharisees, and he essentially says this to us today, I'm God. I have the authority to forgive sins. Um, and here's my question to us today. Have you encountered this Jesus? Have you encountered this Jesus? If you have, are you bent on helping carry those who haven't? Now, yes, the man was willing, right? Like, I, I understand that. This man was willing. But have you in your life a list of your circle and you find yourself just tears, sometimes falling on the page because your heart breaks for them to know Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, that means you're praying for them. You're laboring for them. You long for them to come to know Jesus. Jesus says, I'm God. I have authority to forgive sins. If you have encountered this Jesus, and just a challenge, just a challenge for, for us, not, not, not you, but us. In what ways are you engaging them, lovingly so, with, with, with the gospel? Final thoughts. If you're, um, you know, if you find yourself in this story this morning, where, where would you find yourself? Who would you be? Are, are you in the immovable crowd, skeptical of who Jesus is, curious about what he's saying? I'm just an observer. Or are you who, when I read this story, who I want to be? Are you a roof digger? This morning, we prayed for teachers, that prayed for students that are getting ready to go to school. I don't know a bigger, better roof digger than someone who watches 20 plus kids and then goes home to their family. And I just can't think of a, of, of, I'm amazed, honestly, that you have this amazing opportunity to be a missionary into an extremely difficult field five days a week and carry some of the burdens that they carry and, and the pains that some of these kids bring to you. I, I, it's, I can't even imagine to what you experience, but can I just, as best I know how to, encourage you, no matter what your, your, your uh, profession, to be a roof digger. Say, I don't, no, no bridge, no, no barrier. No barrier is about to block this bridge for me, loving them to Christ Jesus with his gospel. Are you a roof digger? In closing, are you, are you the one who needs forgiveness of sins? Are you the one who needs forgiveness of sins? Um, we're about to close and there's gonna be a group of guys that are a group of, a team of people who are right over here uh, and right over here in the corner of this room. And we cannot wait to just engage you in conversation if that's you having a longing for this need for forgiveness. I'm gonna pray for us. The guys who lead worship, they're gonna come on up and they're gonna sing us out this morning. Father, we're so grateful for your love and your truth and your grace. Lord, you clearly are motioning to us to be a missionary people, to be sent, to, 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 to connect with messy people, to connect with people who bear burdens. And, and myself and each other, helping each other bear burdens. Lord, we just ask 
you'd give us the strength and the heartbeat, a continuous heartbeat to do so. Lord, may you just have your way in our hearts and in our minds. May we just make absolutely much of you as we sing in this time of response. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.